All right, um, let's start. I think it's more people joining as we start, so that's fine. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of Monash Advanced Imaging Seminar Series. And it's my pleasure to have Suliana, whom I had the fortune of meeting at GRC a couple of years ago, and was very much happy to see the kind of work uh, that she carries on. Um, she's someone who's uh, carrying out uh, developments in optics as well as using them for fundamental biological questions in equal footing. And it's amazing to see such an interdisciplinary scientist who brings together everything in one go. Uh, Suliana studied physics and mathematics at Rice University, uh, where she get, got her bachelor's degree, and then she joined Harvard University for her PhD with uh, Dave White. Um, after that, she did a postdoc at MIT and then worked with Jennifer Lipid Gott Schwartz at NIH before starting her own lab at EPFL in Lausanne. Um, with that, Suliana, um, I'll let you take the stage or the screens and carry on with your talk. Thank you very much for this uh, for again to come to the seminar. Thanks, Sankal. Thanks for inviting me. It's nice to be here with you all. I'm, um, I'm going to share with you a talk that's focused around mitochondria. But as Sintel mentioned, the overarching goal of my research group is to use experiments uh, to reveal the biophysical principles that organize, you know, organelles in the cell, generally speaking. And the way that we do this is by developing and using super resolution microscopy mostly. And uh, our approach is to collect large data sets and to use quantitative analysis to try to tease out some of the organizing principles. And so we're gonna focus today on how that works, how that's worked out for us with mitochondria, which are such amazing, complex and beautiful organelles um, that have really diverse patterns and so um, diverse behaviors. And so it's been exciting to try to tease out those, those underlying patterns. So, of course, you know, in a microscopy talk, <laughs> we should talk about where we are with our methodology. And there are so many um, amazing microscopies out there. Uh, since we're interested in organelles in particular, however, we can be rather frustrated by light microscopy by the fact that there's this limit here. And this is the diffraction limit, of course, the diffraction limit of light. And this is due to a combination of the, the wave-like nature of light plus the um, the finite size of all of our optics. And so if we could make really um, uh, infinitely sized optics, we could uh, decrease the, increase the numerical aperture, so to speak, and, and decrease the, the, um, the cutoff here, but only so much still, right? And so uh, that's one of the reasons why electron microscopy is, is so much uh, more suitable for looking down at the uh, submolecular molecular atomic scales is because the wavelength of the electron is so small. And so over the years, however, in particular the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, there were a number of uh, breakthroughs that allowed us to start to look beyond the diffraction limit using light microscopy. And these are super, called super resolution microscopies. They're breaking the diffraction limit of light. And there are a number of different methods that have been developed over the years a couple main classes of, of these methods include structured illumination microscopy or SIM, uh, STED, stimulated emission depletion microscopy, and then localization types of microscopies like PALM or STORM. And so I put them on this, uh, on this scale bar to, uh, in, a, in a manner that's, that's sensible because SIM doesn't give you quite as much improvement of, in resolution and unless you go to nonlinear SIM, which uh, almost nobody does. And so uh, there are these kind of trade-offs in microscopy that you have to consider. And one of them is one of the reasons why SIM is still useful and, and as, as well as super resolution microscopy in general, is that the light dose or the energy dose that um, you're imaging waves bring or imaging particles, whether it's photons or electrons bring to the sample are very different. And so here, um, because, well, you have higher resolution compared to SIM, but you also deliver, generally speaking, more energy to the sample, you, that results in photo damage. 
And the same is true for electron microscopy, right? You're, you're bombarding your sample with these high energy electrons. Uh, you want the best resolution, you need high energy. And so that also damages the sample. So there are these interesting trade-offs that we have to work with. And so uh, we think of these trade-offs a little bit as you know, between dynamic, live, and um, fixed. And there's also another reason why we would put all this effort into doing super resolution microscopy instead of electron microscopy. So beyond dynamics, there's also the fact of, of color. And light is, visible light is uh, very uniquely suited to separating signals based on wavelength. And so uh, over the years, many labs have developed different kinds of probes that allow us to tag uh, different proteins and different colors. And so this allows us, of course, this multi-dimensional view of these different organelles. And our favorite organelles in, in my group are the centriole and mitochondria. Um, and I have to tell you that mitochondria has sort of taken the lead a little bit <laughs> over these past years. We've just gotten really excited about um, how amazing they are. So in terms of microscope or microscopy development, um, we're not big optics people, actually, in my, in my group in general. I've, had, I've hosted a, a few great optical engineers and physicists, but we really um, think about the microscope as a tool for discovery. And so for us, this, there's sort of a, a loop between um, you know, doing quantitative biophysics and then developing our microscopes. And so we, we don't separate the two from each other. And one of the, that's one of the reasons why we've gone in this particular direction, which is we, we call high throughput. Um, and you know, the, the reasons that we go for this high throughput super resolution is because you know, biology is noisy on the one hand, and so you'd like to collect lots and lots of examples to understand the diversity of states, but also maybe to average out that noise under certain conditions. And on the other hand, you know, organelles, our favorite objects, our favorite subjects of study are, are small. They're at this diffraction limit. And so what we've wanted to do is to collect, you know, large data sets. And one way we could do this is to automate our microscopes so that they become more, um, you know, autonomous, so to speak, that we can press a button and they'll be able to, to collect data sets through the night even. And um, this is something that we have a couple of publications about, and we pursued this to a certain point where we could um, you know, collect data from multiple fields of view. And, and here you might say, okay, well, I can already do that with uh, normal commercial microscopes. I would say the tricky part here is these nonlinear optical transitions that underlie super resolution microscopies. And so we've focused on um, this idea of uh, starting to develop microscopes that can better detect what's going on in the sample as you collect so that you can apply the right amount of light at the right time. And this is essential for collecting high quality um, localization microscopy data in particular. On the other hand, um, you know, so you can set up your microscope so that it runs by itself. That's great. Um, then you know, you yourself don't need to sit at it uh, even better. And uh, on the other hand, we can also think about parallelizing our microscopes. And the way that we do this is by increasing our fields of view. And this may seem, again, some, somewhat, um, you know, clear that, that, that this would be uh, something nice and it seems like something that's sort of done. Indeed, again, there are many microscopes that you can use in a core facility that have you know, that have relatively uh, uniform and large fields of view. Um, again, this is not the case for the types of microscopies that uh, we're working with here. And I'd like to just share with you some of the, um, the things that we've been able to do by considering the um, matching basically the light that we deliver to the sample with the detector that we're using to image the sample. And so um, this first example is a storm uh, image. It's a localization microscopy image. And it shows a couple of cells that have been stained for uh, tubulin and also for uh, mitochondrial TOM20. And what you see is that 
um, we have, we're able to collect across this relatively large field of view, um, really uniform in terms of resolution. And so what this allows us is, is um, you know, a, about a, a factor of 10 to 20 fold improvement in terms of throughput because a typical storm image is only this large. And why is that? Um, the reason for that is that often what people are doing to illuminate their sample for localization microscopy is to um, bring in a Gaussian laser beam. This is important because the laser beam will allow the molecules to cycle through these nonlinear optical transitions that underlie this microscopy. And in doing so, um, you have essentially a non-uniform illumination. And so we've engineered the light to, um, uh, to take this, this 150 by 150 micron uh, field of view. Uh, in this middle case, we've done something uh, that goes even further for total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. And the joy of turf is that you're really illuminating at the surface. And the way that you do this is by bringing in light. Typically what you do with uh, objective turf is you bring in the light and it, it, um, if you're coming in at a uh, angle that's greater than the critical angle, then eventually all the light will be reflected back, except the evanescent field, which will just penetrate the first 100, 150 nanometers of the sample. And this is great, but it's very, again, limited in field of view. You see there's a theme here. And uh, the approach that we took here instead was to use a waveguide as a substrate for the cells in this image. And that waveguide, we can actually control the way that the light leaks into the sample. So again, it creates an evanescent field, but now this is over um, millimeter scales. And so each of these little uh, dark dots here is the, the nucleus of the cell. You can see the bright um, cytoplasm of the cell. And so we could use this waveguide-based microscope to image you know, cellular features. We also image DNA origami, and this, these are some of the example DNA origamis. We're using a grid that's um, four by three um, binding sites on the DNA origami, and we are basically painting the sample then using um, imaging probes. And these probes then uh, reveal the underlying structure of the origami, which is, has this regular spacing of about uh, 20 nanometers along the grid. And so this is the kind of resolution we can achieve. And then finally, you know, I mentioned that we're not only doing um, these high power fixed cell experiments, we're also doing live experiments. And the way that we do that in my group is using a microscope called the, the ISIM, the Instant Structure Illumination Microscope. This is a fantastic microscope that was originally developed by Andrew York and Hari Shroff at the NIH. And we had the joy of going to visit them um, and uh, really we're impressed with the microscope. It can go up to 100 frames per second, so really fast. And the reason it can be so fast is because it's actually scanning a, a grid of points. And so it's very similar to a spinning disk confocal in that sense, that it illuminates the sample with a grid of, um, with multiple points of light. And so each of those points of light, of course, doesn't need to scan the whole field of view. It can scan just a part of it. And so what you're seeing here is a live image of, um, of the ER. And uh, if, if your screen is large enough, you can see the fluctuating tubules of the ER. And uh, you can see that, you know, we're collecting data here at around 10 frames per second, and you can really see very nicely the details of the endoplasmic reticular network. Now, we're taking data at 10 frames per second, not 100 frames per second. And as um, people who use microscopy, you probably are familiar with this idea that you can't use the full um, speed of every microscope because then uh, you're going to photo bleach. It's, it's not going to um, give you information about the dynamics that you're interested in. And so, in fact, now that we have a flat field, we can actually use to our advantage the massive speed of this instrument by tiling together and looking at multiple fields of view in parallel. And so that's what this corner image is. Uh, it, it's a stitched um, uh, image that comes from nine fields of view that were all collected within uh, less than five seconds of each other. 
And so we can actually iteratively um, collect data from multiple fields of view and then um, it's effectively improve our throughput even further. So we can use that high speed collection capacity to improve the amount of data that we can collect. So these are the kinds of ideas that we've uh, pushed forward. Um, not, although they are, you know, in the end methods, so to speak, for us, they're, they're really essential tools. And I'd like to share with you then a, um, just a brief interlude a, uh, example of how we've used this throughput to uh, reveal things about uh, the centriel. So I'm just gonna show you one example of the centriel. So this is uh, one of the kinds of data sets we're able to collect on centrioles. This is a, a centriel or protein called SET152. It decorates a, it, the peripheral, um, sorry, the proximal torus of uh, the centriel. And here we're looking at purified centrioles that have been um, laid out on a, on a glass cover slip. And then we image many fields of view and we can collect then um, you know, thousands of examples of the centriel stained with different proteins. Now with the ISIM, we can also do this, but we can do this in 3D. And here we're looking at samples that have been expanded. So physically expanded by embedding them in a polymer gel and um, then swelling that gel, well, denaturing the, the protein crosslinks and then uh, swelling that gel. This is a, a method that was developed by Ed Boyden. And it's been now generalized to many different kinds of samples. It's really interesting. Um, and so we can image with the ISIM. And now we can image up to 5,000 three-dimensional particles per hour. So we've been really, again, increased our throughput. And here you can see the Z stack. So we're scanning um, through this sample in a confocal-like manner. And you can see the, the, the hollow in the center of the, the centriole. Now more than that, we can apply the approaches used in electron microscopy to reconstruct uh, 3D structures from 2D in the case of these uh, two-dimensional storm data sets that I showed you. But we can also align and, and average um, these three-dimensional particles to be able to, to reconstruct 3D from 3D. And we've done this then to study the organization of different proteins in the uh, centriole itself and also the procentriole that you see as, as this little cyan blob that's angled off, um, interestingly, not, not perpendicular to the, the um, mother centriole, but at an angle. And we've also been able to look at um, post-translational modifications to tubulin, which are thought to confer important stability pro um, properties to the microtubules within the centriole. So that's my um, little uh, advertisement for, for why it's so important to be able to collect large data sets. We really can see details of the organization of these organelles um, that we wouldn't have been able to, to otherwise. And so now I'd like to shift focus to, to the, the main topic today, which are mitochondria. And I don't need to advertise among this group why uh, mitochondria are so important in the cell. They, ha they play many roles far beyond um, energy production, which is the, the main, of course, uh, um, thing that, that, that even lay people understand very well that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Um, uh, and so, you know, we're, we're fascinated, however, um, beyond the uh, health, human health implications, and uh, in, just by the, the um, biophysical properties, again, of, of mitochondria. So mitochondria, as you can see here, take on many different shapes and sizes, and they're incredibly dynamic. And those dynamics have fascinated many groups for many years. And um, one of the things that we like to think about is why are mit mitochondria organized the way that they are? And why do they um, move and divide the way that they do? And of course, we're very um, inspired by the notion that mitochondria are ancient endosymbionts, where you know, perhaps some of the principles that uh, governed their dynamics and, and uh, fission as, as free living organisms have been either re-evolved or retained over time. 
And this is a this is not a, a new idea. It's something that I think has hasn't um, guided many in this field over the years. And we're relatively new to the field. Really, uh, still consider ourselves very much students in this field. Um, but one of the things that people have uh, have teased out over the years is what is what is driving mitochondria to divide? And so what are the molecular and cellular components that are involved in mitochondrial fission? And uh, what I'm summarizing here is just one um, example of what you could glean from this really huge and um, well-developed body of work about mitochondrial fission, which is that there are a number of different steps, classically speaking, that give rise to, um, that allow one mitochondria to become two. And so one of them is that the ER and mitochondria interact, and these interactions um, uh, give rise to a, a preconstriction. There's, uh, there's polymerization of actin, and again, like the per particular molecular components have been identified here, spire protein and so on. Um, after this, uh, one of the roles that the ER is believed to play is that it, um, it, it signals through these mitos complexes to um, uh, license mitochondrial DNA replication at the division site. And so this is a, a beautiful um, example of how, um, you know, coordination of replication and division might be coordinated. And then after this, um, there are these transmembrane adapter um, uh, proteins that sit in the outer membrane of the mitochondria, and they allow DRP1, uh, the dynamin-related protein that polymer to polymerize, um, assemble at the division site, and then hydrolyze um, uh, in order to constrict and generate force. And so this is the driving force that takes the mitochondria from one to two. And so this is a, a very brief summary of, of what, uh, what's um, been developed in the field. Of course, there's, there's much more out there that I don't have time to summarize. Um, but there are still open questions that we, and, and these have fascinated us, um, including, you know, how do mitochondria decide, where am I actually gonna divide? Where are these contacts gonna be located? And, um, what determines which of these, you know, once, once this preconstriction forms um, and DRP1 assembles, what determines which of those constrictions will actually divide? Um, and then finally, how is mitochondrial transcription organized spatially and coordinated with these dynamics? And so these are questions that I've had the pleasure of working on over the past five or so years with a number of different um, great students and postdocs in the group. Um, these are all students except Tatiana. I'm going to focus first on, on the work of Tatiana Cleal, who's uh, been a, a great postdoc in my lab. So with Tatiana, we were very curious, as I said, about you know, how mitochondria decide where to divide. And we were really thinking about physiology. So you know, are there physiological signals that the mitochondria gives to the cell? and to you know, other organelles to tell them, you know, I am ready to divide here. And the thought was just uh, sort of a mitocentric <laughs> perspective. A lot of times we had the feeling that, um, you know, mitochondria were described as kind of these passive organelles. And we, we thought, you know, the, for us, what, you know, what if they're actually the, the driving, um, uh, the, the driver in this process? And so what Tatiana did was she looked at many different fissions. And here I'm showing you a montage of fissions um, where you see this uh, little yellow arrow pointing at exactly where that particular mitochondria is gonna divide one frame later. So each of these snapshots comes from a movie. And this is just a single still within that time-lapse movie. And so what I would have expected is that mitochondria should be ready to divide, um, in theory, you know, anywhere along their length. I mean, why, why would they not? Um, anywhere along their length, 
save at the very tips where the mitochondria are highly curved. And this is, of course, a very biophysical perspective on it. But as far as we knew, you know, there's no sort of long range order um, organizing mitochondria on the scale of microns. There are, of course, the crustae, but those repeat at much more, um, a much smaller intervals. And so we would have thought that, you know, it's equally likely to divide more or less all along the length. And this is not at all um, what we observed. And so this was extremely surprising to us that in fact, when you plot the um, a histogram, so the number of fissions that occur at different locations along these very diverse mitochondria, you actually see that there are two very distinct populations. And um, notice here that we're plotting the number of fissions as a function of the percent uh, position of fission. So we're sort of normalizing for the length of the mitochondria. And uh, what we find then is that mitochondria tend to divide either uh, at around 20% of their length or closer to the middle. Uh, that's this green population, right, peaking at around the middle of 50%. And so, you know, of course, we wondered what in the world is happening here? Um, why do mitochondria have this patterning? And also, what, what drives this patterning? And um, one of the things that we, were, um, we decided to do was to, to, to talk to some uh, collaborators in the SHUV, the university hospital here, who work on, um, on uh, who study mitochondria and their, their role in, in the heart. Um, and so they, they offered to us um, some um, mouse cardiomyocytes. And this was, this was a, a really lovely collaboration then that developed with Thierry Petrozini's, uh, Petrozini's group at the SHUV. And so these are some of the cardiomyocytes that they gave us. You can actually still see them um, twitching. So um, it, it was really fun for us to see these, these primary cells. And what you see here are the mitochondria as they, they move around in these um, primary heart cells. And each of these little orange arrows indicates to you where a mitochondria is dividing. And so you can follow them a little bit with your eye and see for yourself what these divisions look like. And um, what we were really interested in seeing, of course, is whether this pattern reproduced itself also in these very different cells. Um, previously, what I had shown you were the um, data from these uh, COS7 cells, green monkey kidney cells, where mitochondria are maybe not quite as important as they are in the heart. And so what you see is that indeed in these uh, primary cardiomyocytes, we still do see this pattern that emerges where you have a, a strong um, increase in the probability of fission at around 20% or at around 50%. And in between, there's this strong dip um, where there is very little to no fission. And so we decided to pursue, or Tatiana decided to pursue this question of, you know, why are these different um, populations of fission, how are they, um, what are the fates of the mitochondria that uh, divide at the, at the periphery versus the, the mid zone, as we call them? And so what she looked at was a number of different um, physiological sensors to try to understand whether there's a physiological signature that underlies these different geometries of fission. And there are, of course, many sensors that have been developed over the years, and she tried a lot of them out and um, you know, settled on uh, the, the few that you see listed here in the end as the, kind of the, the cleanest, best developed um, sensors. But she, she tried many others as well, if you're in case you're curious. And um, what she found is that, you, you know, so this is what the, the data looks like um, for a peripheral fission. You can see that this uh, mitochondria is about to divide here, and then it buds off this small daughter mitochondria. Um, here's a mid-zone fission where you see that it's about to divide right here, and then it splits into two really equally sized mitochondria. Um, and similarly for this uh, um, Ross sensor called MitoSox, um, she followed fissions in these with, uh, in, and um, divided them 
then based on where they divided along their length. And so um, here you see these four different classes of mitochondria. Mitochondria that divide near the, near the periphery in the first 25% of their length. Um, and then mitochondria that divide in the mid zone. Um, and then finally, the larger mitochondria that divides, uh, that's divided peripherally. And what you see is that the physiology of these mitochondria that divide either near the mid zone or are the large daughter of a peripheral fission have very similar um, uh, readouts, both in terms of their membrane potential and also their ROS levels, um, and are also very similar to non dividing mitochondria. That's what's indicated here by this um, sort of gray blue band. Or, mitochondria that are not actively dividing. Um, and this is as opposed to these small daughter peripheral um, mito mitochondria that have a, a diminished membrane potential and an elevated ROS level. And so this was fascinating for us to observe that you could really see differences in physiology. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, people ask sometimes is, well, you know, the, the, those differences are not so big. And I think it's, you know, it's true, they're, they're not huge. But I think it's important to understand that first, you know, we can't measure all of the different physiological hallmarks at the same time. But in a systems type of perspective, you would consider that all of these different hallmarks together are give a much more robust signal. And so if we actually had the ability to measure um, many of these markers simultaneously, I expect that sort of the convolution of those um, markers would give us something that's much more robust. But of course, we can't, we can't tell that directly from uh, individual measurements of, of individual markers. Um, and so, you know, this was pointing us in a certain direction, which is, you know, do mid-zone and peripheral fissions serve different functions and different fates of mitochondria? And we were inspired by the work of Orian Shirihai and his group, in particular this, this wonderful twig paper, which um, uh, kind of broke a lot of new ground in terms of understanding the mi mitochondrial life cycle. And we then really started pursuing this notion that, you know, what are the different fates? And, um, you know, Twig had pointed out, as, as many others have, have followed up uh, since, that there are these different fates that, that mitochondrial uh, fission serves. On the one hand, mitochondria have to divide to proliferate since they contain DNA. You can't make a mitochondria without a mitochondria. You need one to start with. And then on the other hand, degradation. So mitochondria that are damaged or contain damaged components should be degraded um, by this process that's now very well known as mitophagy. And so we followed up on this idea by looking at, um, first of all, the, the genetic content, the mitochondrial DNA content of dividing mitochondria. And we looked in particular at, uh, first of all, replicating nucleoids by um, uh, expressing uh, this, this um, probe called Twinkle. And you can see that what happens is that in these small daughter mitochondria, of, of peripheral fissions, there are many of them which contain zero replicating mitochondrial DNAs. <clears throat> this is as opposed, again, to those that divide at the mid-zone or the larger um, daughters of peripheral fissions that all have relatively similar distributions of replicating um, mitochondrial DNA. In addition, we looked at what happens when you damage DNA and we had only this, uh, this general tool for, for damage, which was exposure to ultraviolet light. But in this case, what you see is that the number of uh, mitochondria that have no um, DNA at all is, is uh, actually less than it was for replicating DNA. In fact, it's elevated. And the idea that we have in mind is that um, these damaged DNA should be uh, sequestered into these small peripheral uh, fissions um, and targeted for degradation. 
And indeed, when you look at uh, more closely at the molecular machinery that is underlying these different fissions, the peripheral versus midzone, you see that the peripheral fissions interact with uh, lysosomes prior to, um, uh, prior to fission. So in the case of, of a contact with lysosomes, you're always looking at these fissions that are taking place in the first 25% with a few exceptions, right? So there are a couple of, of other locations where lysosomes have contacted before fission, um, but it's incredibly rare. And in the case that there's no contact with lysosomes, then there, there are many more that are mid-zone fissions. Um, and this has been shown previously to lead to um, you know, mitophagy, uh, to the upstream of mitophagy, these contacts with lysosomes. On the other hand, you know, this great, these great works from Gia Voltz, um, Jody Nonari's groups and others have shown that these interactions with the ER are very important for proliferative um, mitochondrial fissions. And this is also uh, what, what we found here when considering these different uh, geometric signatures is that the mitochondria that do not contact the, the ER before fission tend to these peripheral fissions. And this for us was really a relief because um, we had, of course, read the papers of, of Gia and, and um, Jody very, very closely. And we're always really curious about why the ER wasn't always required. And so for us, this helped to solve a little bit that mystery of the, the cases where um, ER is not involved. Uh, they tend to be these peripheral fissions that eventually lead to degradation and not um, licensing of mitochondrial DNA re replication, which is um, triggered by the, these contacts with the ER. Um, so finally, we looked at uh, different mitochondrial um, adapter proteins for DRP1. And here, I really have to um, thank, first of all, Tim Y. Uh, we collaborated with his group at, at the Pasteur, and he was incredibly helpful for um, generating these cell lines, these knock-in cell lines. And then also um, Mike Ryan, whose group provided the knockouts that I'll show you in just a second. So we, we were curious about the roles of different fission machineries in these different, um, in these mitochondria that were dividing in different geometries and also undergoing different fates. And so we looked at um, not only MFF uh, and, and FIS1, but also um, mid-49 mid and mid-51. And what you see is that when you look at the peripheral fissions, they tend to be um, relatively uh, less enriched in MFF GFP as compared with the mid-zone fissions. And when you look at FIS1 uh, in contrast, you see that FIS1 tends to be enriched not only at the site, in fact, not really at the site of fission, but rather along the entire um, daughter mitochondria uh, in the case of these peripheral fissions, right? You see that it, there's this enrichment. Um, and so there, you know, the role of FIS1 as a, it shouldn't really be called an adapter protein, and it doesn't look like one either, um, but it does seem to be marking somehow those, uh, the, the, the mitochondria that should undergo this peripheral fission. And then we also looked, as I said, at these different, um, these different knockouts, and we looked then at the, the fission, the peripheral versus mid-zone fission rates, and so the peripheral um, fissions are always shown in this sort of browny orange color, and then green is the mid-zone. And you see that this is the sort of resting wild type balance between those two different types of fission. DRP1 is, is heavily implicated in all the fissions that we observed. Um, I should just point out that this is, you know, in the literature, you'll find that um, there are other kinds of fissions that are mentioned that, are, that do not require DRP1. But in our experience, this is linked with, um, with pushing uh, fissions by using different pharmacological um, reagents and sometimes uncouplers. 
which leads to you know different kinds of fission, no question. Um, here we were we were always looking at spontaneous fissions, and so this is you know why we think that we observe things that are a bit different than what's been reported in some of the literature. Now, when we look at these, uh, these same adapters or non-adapters, MFF and FIS-1 at the knockouts, um, what you see is that the, um, the peripheral fission rates are not really affected by the knockout of MFF, whereas um, the uh, mid-zones very much are, and the inverse is true for FIS-1. And so this for us was really um, a, a, a very strong confirmation that these adapters do play these really distinct roles in governing these uh, two different kinds of fissions that lead to different fates and take place at different locations along mitochondria. And so this is our overall kind of model, which is that there are two different kinds of fission that are going on. One is upregulated during stress, and we saw this also by um, pushing the cardiomyocytes to, to produce more ATP, stimulating them um, using isoproteranol. And that is, uh, these, peripher these peripheral fissions are the type of uh, fission that is upregulated during stress. And those lead to degradation um, through mitophagy. And this is, as opposed to this other type of fission, which is really important for proliferation, for creating more mitochondria. And those take place at the mid zone and are coordinated with mitochondrial DNA replication and uh, use the MFF adapter protein. So um, that takes me to the end of that particular part. And I'll just spend a, a few minutes then um, telling you a little bit about our explorations into mitochondrial membrane tension and uh, a little bit of our future as well. Okay, so one of the things that we noticed um, as we were observing mitochondria is that not all constrictions lead to fission. And I'm not only speaking about, you know, these pre-constrictions that are governed by contacts with the ER and actin polymerization, but also DRP1 um, uh, 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 active uh, constrictions, as we would call them, where you see DRP1 accumulating, um, constricting, uh, but then uh, it doesn't necessarily always divide. And so let's look at a few examples. So first of fissions, and these yellow arrows will always show you where to look so you can see where the fission's going to happen. And um, so here are a couple of fissions. And you see DRP1 accumulate, and it, it eventually uh, divides. Um, and on the other hand, you see also these reversals, right? So DRP1 accumulates, but then it disassembles before the mitochondria divides. And so we, we saw many examples of these reversals, and we really wondered, you know, what's happening there? Um, and so we looked at organelle contacts, for example. We looked at um, DRP1 accumulation. We looked at the constriction size. And of course, eventually the constriction has to um, become smaller in the case that it actually divides. But you know, at the, cons the, the progression of constriction really looked extremely similar for these two different um, uh, kinds of events, the, the ones that actually divided and then the ones that um, uh, uh, disassembled and reversed. And so the way that we start to think about this was, you know, we went back to thinking about mitochondrial fission as, as um, a, a reaction happen, happening along a reaction coordinate. This, uh, on the one hand, we have a single mitochondria, and on the other hand, we have two. And they're separated by a hemifusion, uh, a, a hemifusion state. And this hemifusion state then um, needs to be overcome in order to uh, allow the mitochondria to actually go ahead and divide. And so we thought about what energies go into uh, creating that barrier. And we could consider two different kinds of energy. One is the bending energy, the energy that it takes to bend that membrane. Um, and then on the other hand, we could, we could consider that there could be contributions from stretching the membrane as well. 
And so this, the stretching energy comes from a combination of membrane tension and changes in membrane area. And so uh, this for us was also very evocative to see that when mitochondria divide, they often kind of spring back from each other. And for us, this seemed to us like, you know, if you're pulling on a string, then you can cut it more easily. But then also when it, it once it's cut, then your hands will jerk apart, right? And so this is how we were thinking of it schematically. Um, now in um, in vitro experiments, you can actually estimate the uh, membrane tension. And the way that you do this is by minimizing the overall free energy of the whole system. And this tells you that you can actually relate the size of the membrane tube that you can pull from a, from a vesicle or so on. You can relate that, the, the size of that tube to the tension of the membrane itself. And as it turns out, there are many membrane tubes, uh, little membrane tubules that are pulled from mitochondria just by molecular motors, we believe, in the cell as well. And so we estimated the, the mitochondrial membrane tension uh, from these tubule diameters. So these are tubule diameters that correspond to uh, constrictions that lead to fission versus constrictions that lead to reversal. And you see that there's a lot of overlap, but there is a difference in the means, meaning that if you have a higher tension, you're more likely to go ahead and divide. So the reversals were under lower uh, membrane tension. As it turns out, um, you know, so it's, it's quite well known that mitochondria move along the cytoskeletal networks and microtubule networks are very important for this. Um, and uh, so we thought, you know, we could depolymerize microtubules and in doing so then we should perturb the membrane tension. And the way that we measured the, the effect of depolymerizing uh, microtubules using the cortisol on membrane tension was by using a, um, a new um, uh, fluorescence lifetime-based membrane tension sensor. And so this is, these are made by our collaborators in the University of Geneva, Stefan Matil's group. And he's worked a lot with Aurelien Roux over the years to develop these membrane tension sensors that are essentially like um, chemical flippers. And so the way that they, the flippers are oriented in the membrane will depend on the, uh, the tension of the membrane. And so you can ca calibrate this actually using giant unilateral vesicles and pulling on them to, to modulate that tension. Um, and so uh, we, what we we're looking at here is what this fluorescence lifetime looks like in cells where we either had the, the microtubule network um, as is versus where we had depolymerized it using nicotazole. And so we really indeed saw that the uh, nicotazole treatment decreased the lifetime, meaning that it decreased the membrane tension. And at the same time, we then measured uh, fission events in these cells that had uh, their microtubule networks um, perturbed by nicotazole, and you could see that the number of fissions really increased um, relative to the number of, uh, sorry, the number of reversals really increased relative to the number of fissions. And so you increase the, the probability of reversing when you depolymerize um, microtubules. And so we concluded that memory tension, um, which is largely due to these mitochondrial microtubule interactions, really enhances fusion, as uh, fission. So with that, I'm going to skip a little bit forward and I'll tell you, uh, uh, give you a tiny peek into wh where we're going next with our technologies and also with our, our quantitative biophysical questions. So one of the things that we think about in microscopy is what kind of microscopy to use and when. And it's a decision that everybody makes the moment that they sit down at a microscope, right? First, you have to decide which microscope is the right tool for you. And then you, ha you have to design your experiment. So you need to choose the parameters, like what is my frame rate going to be? Um, you know, what sorts of laser intensity or, or illumination intensity will I choose? And all of these decisions are based on trade-offs, right? So we don't decide to take 
the most um, high contrast image all the time because then we won't be able to take a very long time lapse. So we always have to make these decisions. And so underlying that in the back of our minds, we actually, um, even if you're just starting out in microscopy, you know that the, these trade-offs exist. And so this is one way of thinking about them, that there's a, a trade-off between spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and photo bleaching and phototoxicity. And so one thing to do is to realize that there are different microscopies that are better suited for each of these. So of course, super resolution would be, would give you a better spatial resolution, whereas um, light sheet could give you, you know, lower phototoxicity, so better long-term imaging. And so we make these decisions. And um, one of the things that we would like to be able to do though, is to make these decisions on the dynamic time scale of the samples that we're looking at. And let's just take mitochondria as an example. Mitochondria, they're diffusing around along or walking along the mito, uh, microtubule network, um, but then they're going to divide. And those two processes can take place on very different time scales, right? So the, some mitochondria really don't move very much. Um, and then fission may take place in you know, five or 10 seconds. And so you'd like to be able to capture perhaps these very different dynamic events. And so what we're working on is um, some version of intelligent microscopy that will be able to um, detect such events and respond to them in real time. And so, you know, no matter how excellent and intelligent, uh, you know, so this is Dora who built our ISIM, a really remarkable student. Um, and, you know, in, in the development community, we often focus on things like speed, resolution, and throughput, as I've been focusing here. Um, but what we would really like is a, is a control, an intelligent controller for the microscope that um, doesn't have to rely on the human input. And so this is the kind of uh, schematic that we and others in the community are envisioning. You know, we would like to have our microscope um, endowed with an intelligent analyzer that can consider the data and make decisions about how to adapt or perturb the measurement um, based on what's happening in the sample. And so this is something that we're doing with mitochondrial fission where we have a neural network that can detect mitochondrial fissions before they occur. How does it do that? Well, it's really probabilistic, right? You can't say for sure that a mitochondria is going to divide, but you can, based on its constriction state and also whether DRP1 is present at that constriction site, you can say that this is a more likely site for mitochondria to, mitochondria to divide. And so we can detect them and we can uh, change our frame rate uh, at that, on the fly in that moment so that we can uh, capture the details of those uh, divisions more carefully. And so these are some of the questions that we're, um, that we're working on now. Uh, we're looking at fusion. Julius in particular is started to look at, um, you know, how do mitochondria decide where to fuse? Um, a new doctoral student in the group uh, is interested in determining what sets the, the trajectories of mitochondria in the cell. And then finally, as a kind of important follow-up question to the work that uh, I described from Tatiana, what is actually setting the patterning that underlies mitochondrial fission? And is it related to nucleoid spacing, uh, which is also known to be non-uniform across the mitochondrial network? Um, I'll, I'll just mention here that uh, my group has funding from the European Research Council and also from the Human um, Frontiers in Science Program. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking for uh, new team members to join us on this fantastic voyage. And so with that, I will just thank um, all of the wonderful team members that I've had the chance to work with over the years um, and our funding sources. And finally, none of the work would have been done without the fantastic collaborators that we have, um, both in mitochondria, we work very closely with Jean-Claude Martineau and he's taught us so much about mitochondria over the years, Aurelia and Stefan, um, and uh, Timothy, Tim, Tim Y, and then Thierry Petrosini. 
And I also mentioned some of the work that we had uh, done on centrioles with Pierre Gonsi and Paul Guichard's groups. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this, this journey uh, through mitochondria using microscopies. And I will look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Sileana, for that fantastic talk. It's always a pleasure to look at all the movies again and again. Um, the floor is open to questions. You may raise your hand using the raise hand function, or you can type in your question in the Q&A and I'll unmute you and request you to speak. Uh, the first question is from Peter Sue from Sydney. Peter, you can go ahead and ask, please. Peter? All right, uh, Peter is not responding. Uh, Mike Ryan has a question. Mike, you wanna go ahead? Thanks, hi, Siliana. Hi. Uh, Siliana, thank you very, for the, thank you very much for the, for the great talk. Uh, two, two questions, uh, and it relates to that peripheral mitochondria that you see. Uh, one is obviously you're not seeing actin, uh, or at least ER at, at the, that area. So something else must be driving the constriction. Uh, do you have evidence that that's a, a, a cytoskeletal uh, event or is it something else? Um, or is it just DRP1 doing that? Um, that's number one. I love one. this question, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I was very disturbed by this actually. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, yes, we did look at actin as well and you don't see actin accumulating the way that it does at mid-zone fissions. And so I thought, what in the world? Because how do you generate enough force to actually deform it for then DRP1 to assemble? Because DRP1 is not supposed to be able to really assemble without a preconstriction. So I found this very disturbing. And, um, and so Tatiana and I talked about this a lot. And um, one possibility is that microtubules are indeed involved. Um, but I, I think that this still bears um, yeah, so in, in, our, in our manuscript, you will see that we've, we've tried to dissect the arrival times of different machineries um, for both peripheral and mid-zone fissions. And so you do see that, um, you know, that, that there is a, a sequence of events that, that includes, um, yeah, I mean, it, we, we think that it's related to microtubule pushing at the site, but it's, I think it's 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 still quite preliminary to to say precisely what what generates that that pre preconstrictive force. <laughs> but, 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 but you you never saw, or did you ever see um, non ER at the mid zone fission sites, or is it always exclusively ER actin? Um, I would say that it was like 90 percent, 90, 95 percent ER actin. And you know, you can sometimes miss it, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, okay. yeah, it was, it was, it was really. Uh, it just argues in that our the two very different mechanisms yeah. for, for driving that DRP1 dependent fish. Yeah. Interesting. What, what about, sorry, the next, next question, and I'll shut up then, Sentil. Um, the dead zone area that you've got um, between a peripheral fission yeah. and a mid zone, that there is an area that is strangely more devoid of fission going on there. Yes. Um, yes, so, any you know, comments? well, the first thing we thought of was nucleoid occlusion. I don't know if you have other thoughts. Um, we thought of nucleoid occlusion, I mean, partly because, you know, it would be just beautiful. <laughs> um, it would be like a full circle. Um, and also because uh, you know, it is known that the nucleoids are non-randomly spaced. This has been done very carefully in yeast, um, not so carefully uh, to our knowledge in mammalian systems, but we did, some, uh, we did some quantification of the nucleoid spacing, and it is non-random. And of course, then the question, you know, it kicks the can down the road and says, how, why is that? How is that set? Um, but you know, so what would nucleoid occlusion look like? Uh, well, to us, we thought, huh, maybe these reversals are actually taking place at, in that uh, dip, you know, like maybe you have equal likelihood of nucleating fissions everywhere, but it's just there that they tend to reverse and not divide. But so far, this does not look to be the case. Again, you know, 
you think about the numbers in these uh, histograms that I've shown, it's, it's hundreds. So it, it really takes a long time to analyze all the data, but it doesn't look like that's the case. I would have loved for that to be, for me, that would have been like the, <laughs> the beautiful answer, which is that they reverse there because there's a nucleoid. And so, you know, it's, it's really the, the, the DNA location that's setting it. And then we have to figure out where, how the DNA is positioned, but it doesn't look like that's the case. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, we think about gradients and stuff like that as well, right? That's another alternative is that, um, uh, but, but then why can't MFF, you know, what's preventing it from assembling there? I, it's not clear. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'd love to know your thoughts, actually. Yeah, we, we, we can talk about it sometime. <laughs> Great. You should, you should organize a mitochondria conference here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question is from Vijay. Vijay, do you wanna go ahead? Hi, Suliana, uh, nice, nice to meet you, great talk. Thanks. You can hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, yeah, Mike, I, I asked a couple of questions, a question that uh, I was going to ask as well. So I might actually follow that up a little bit with the discussion you just had and then ask you another question, which is related. Um, I wonder, uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, um, could there be some, uh, some role for lo local calcium microdomains to play so that there's a local, uh, actomyosin or some sort of mechanical contraction that's happening around that peripheral zone when uh, you know the other physiological signals come together yeah I mean I we, we did not consider um, you know patterns that we were not aware of but if are you know if if there's any evidence of, of course you know there's also just the open question which one can search but if there's any evidence of other patterns in the mitochondria, I would love to know about that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. is, is there evidence for these mitose complexes or other complexes to, you know, have some non-irregular or enrichment in, you know, the, the middle versus the, the periphery? Like, th these would be great things to, to ask if, if um, you know, if it's not already known. C certainly in cardiomyocytes, there's a distinct um, uh, aggregation of rhinding receptors and L-type calcium channels all near that C disc, which then, oh. uh, and they're at, you know, and the mitochondria are at the end that they're, the Z discs are like sandwiching entire mitochondria between them. Right. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that would be worth looking at. A, a follow up. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. A, a follow up question to that was going to be, do you find these these peripheral constrictions? Are they, if you looked at it across the field of view, is there some, uh, for lack of a better word, is there some polarity or gradient to where across the cells are they happening all, you know, in a, in a sort of a Poisson random, randomly everywhere, or is there some pattern to that as well? In that I love this question, and it's something that I think, you know, again, a lot of the field has been fascinated about whether there. Are, are different populations of mitochondria maybe different differentially located within the cell, right? Mm. I think this is yeah. part of what you're getting at. Um, yeah. And one of the, one of the things we're so we haven't we haven't looked at that, but part of the reason for that is that so far our cells are all different kinds of shapes, and it, we'd have to think about how to really do that properly. So instead, one of the things that Julius is doing is that he's now look, uh, studying cells that are on these pattern substrates. So they take on various, yeah. very stereotyped shapes and yeah, we can yeah. better analyze, you know, here's the centriole and, yeah. uh, you know, that sets kind of a geometry that we can use as a reference frame because we really like to, to be able to build up a, a coherent, a, you know, a quantitative picture based on many cells. And to do that, I think really the, the, the way to do that is by making the cells more more similar to each other because they're yeah I, was, I, I'm, I might just add to that and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for other other people to discuss uh, uh, ask more questions uh, the thing I would say is this when you change the geometric pattern or you change the microtubule you know polymerization you're effectively changing mechanical stiffness of the cell which also then affects all everything else yeah so um, so that that's where I, I feel it's really important that in biology we really uh, we're, we're at the phase where we're we're getting lots of data, and I think physiological computational modeling with that 
of the actual cell and you know what's going on in these different cell shapes it would be really interesting yeah for sure yeah anyway thank you yeah thank you very much yeah, we're actually starting to a collaboration with uh, Ajay Gopinathan in um, UC Merced, who does simulation combining um, cytoskeletal networks with trafficking. And the, the question, this question of mechanical properties, of course, is maybe not taken into account there. But I think for sure, like the simulations will, will help us understand um, a lot more. Um, thanks, Elena. Um, Peter, are you still there? You've been typing questions. If not, I'll um, I'll ask a question. Oh, he's typed in that his mic is not working. So let me ask his questions on his behalf. Thank you so much for your fantastic talk. I realized that when you define the peripheral zone, actually some of them are branches or buds of the mitochondrial main body. My question is, is there any difference between fission at the branches, the real ends, and the main body? And what is their role during the mtDNA replication? Yeah, we thought about branching. Um, you definitely see that sometimes the fission takes place like just at the branch. We don't have enough uh, data on those specific subsets to say whether there's any, any difference in the pattern. What we typically have, what we've done in this analysis with the branches is to add up all the branches that are on one side of the fission and the other. So you know, you have like a long axis to your mitochondria and then you have the branches coming off. And so we would add up all those side branches and consider that as part of, we treat that as similar to a single long mitochondria that had was longer in length. Um, you know, <laughs> of course, it, it's uh, without understanding what sets the patterning, it's difficult to say, you know, what is the right approach to use, uh, but you see that the pattern does pop out here uh, with that approach. What does it mean? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yep. Um, Peter has a second question about the mitochondrial nanotube. Have you looked at the kinase in kif 5 b and microtubule filament dynamics with mitochondrial fission fusion? Yeah, we tried looking a little bit at kinesins. They're, we find them really hard to image. I don't know if, um, I mean, I'm, I, I know that there are groups who do this with great success, but in, you know, I think expression levels are very difficult to really, you know, you see the filaments and I, I don't know. I'm, I, we never had any data that I really felt comfortable reporting about, I have to say. You kind of see it everywhere and, um, I don't know. Of course, with the, the knock-ins and the, you know, maybe maybe we could get something closer to physiological and, and really see something now. Um, it's, it's probably worth trying, uh, but it, it was a challenging experiment. And we, so we, we, we kind of diverted from that, that path. Yeah, we had the same experience with some of the kinesins. They operate at single molecule levels and it's mm -hmm. very difficult to discern out the moving kinesins from diffusing kinesins yeah. and filter yeah. them out. Um, yep. Uh, cool. I have a few questions if I can ask. I'm, I'm very curious about the large area ISIM. Uh, I'm presuming it's not as simple as just using a low mag high energy objective or a large area of camera. There's something more to that. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I didn't go at all into any of the, <laughs> the optical approaches. Um, we're using uh, an ad adaptation of something called the Kohler integrator. So, of course, you know, a lot of people are familiar with, the, with Kohler illumination. Uh, Kohler illumination um, allows you to, to create from a, a very a highly non-uniform source, which is like a filament, right? It, it, it basically mixes together spatially all the all, all the intensities and so that gives you a nice uniform intensity that's the color um, uh, illuminator but the color integrator it actually is great for um, direct highly directional sources like lasers where you need to not only mix uh, spatially but also in terms of angular distribution to avoid first of all interference fringes from developing but also um, to, to to more uh, homogenize better homogenize your light and so the Kohler integrator was developed 
for engineering purposes, people use this for like laser machining, where you need to have a really sharp edge, uh, very highly uniform, so you can make like a, a square um, profile laser beam and then machine something really nicely. But uh, what we needed to do, first of all, was to take into account that um, you need to not only create a flat field, but you need to create a uniform array of points of light for the ISIM. And moreover, you need to maintain the, the pitch and the spacing between those points of light because you have these arrays of micro lenses and, and, and uh, pinholes that all have to match up, right? Because it's like a confocal. And so uh, Dora actually developed um, a new version, so to speak, of the Kohler integrator that, is, that preserves the pitch. Mm. And so that, that was, uh, it, it, it basically consists of, um, first of all, a rotating diffuser, and this is to slightly decohere the light. And then uh, a pair of microlens arrays, um, this, is, this does the Kohler integration. But then she also had to contract the beam. And this is described in, the, in, in a, her Nature Methods paper. But she had to contract the beam. And this is really counterintuitive. Um, one would think that normally, you know, so each of the lenses in the micro lens array forms like a Kohler illuminator channel. And each of these channels yeah. then mixes together. So it's like a double mixing. Yeah. Um, and so usually you want to use more channels. The more channels you use, the more uniform everything is. But she found that she had to contract it to use fewer channels in order to get uh, this teles telecentricity to be able to propagate the light through all the pinhole arrays. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, we're happy to talk, uh, you know, just get in touch if you want to yeah, sure. try something so, so out that's, with this. That's actually ISIM version two. And then, yeah. and then you said you're not an optics lab. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've had some really talented people who could do whatever. So it's, yeah, yeah I, I just feel lucky. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, my, my second question is, uh, you looked at all this fusion and fission. Have you looked at uh, the rates of mitochondrial fusion, fission, the geometry of organization, etc., with respect to the energetic, energetic requirements of the cell? Um, I mean, I know you're doing mitochondrial potential there, but is it, is, do you have a direct correlation with uh, what is the energy state of the cell, for example? Um, yeah, so let me think. I'm, I'm, I know that Tatiana also looked at, you know, different um, culturing in different media where you're kind of pushing um, ATP production versus, um, so, uh, galactose versus glucose based um, and I you know it does it does change the balance between the two types but it doesn't change the location of this kind of this minimum is, zone yeah so you do you shift the, the yeah the physiological state but also the, the metabolic state can shift the relative rates of peripheral versus mid zone but not the the patterning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Cool. Um, oh, Harry has a question. Um, Harry, you on the mic? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was some uh, great work there. Um, I was just wondering, um, in so there was some work from the Kornman group that was they published in their 2017 paper, where they were looking at force as a predictor for yeah. sites of mitochondrial fission. Um, that seems to match up really, really nicely with um, the work you've shown here. But they were um, applying those forces using a, a cantilever and pattern yes. substrates. Um, what I was wondering is, in this dead zone that you show, if you apply a force there, do you actually get um, a mitochondrial fission? So I guess what I'm really wondering is, is this dead zone because um, in that region there aren't forces applied? Or if there is a force and therefore deformation applied in that dead zone, do they recover? And is, does this part account for the recoveries that you see? That's a great question. I would love to do that experiment. And we're, yeah, we're big fans of Benoit Corman's work. And, and that paper is, um, is really important for showing, you know, what happens upstream of all this, uh, of, of DRP1 assembly is you just need something to deform, right? And uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it would be great to do that experiment. 
We have not done that experiment. We're not really set up to do it, but it would be fun. <laughs> I encourage you. <laughs> I think if you actually look at, at some of the bees pulling forces as well, and they actually show that there are multiple sites of curling where there are very narrow, yes. um, high um, curvature regions. And I yeah. think that in light of seeing your data that they may have also seen that the end pearls bud off. I'm not sure if maybe, I don't know, I have to, I have to go back. And yeah, back. We, also, we also noticed a lot of these purling um, types of modes. And often what happens is you get, you get one fission and then it kind of relaxes the tension is our picture. You know, like it, uh, the purling uh, instability is driven by tension actually by, by this kind of pulling. And then once one of them uh, cuts, and I don't know if it tends to be the end, that, that, that's a good question, um, whether it tends to be the end one that, that divides. It could be that there's a tension gradient across the, across the mitochondria, so it might tend to divide at the end. Um, also a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for the great talk. Perhaps if not the cantilever, one could use this optogenetic recruitment of motor proteins or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I guess you got more uh, more important uh, questions to look at rather than this, you know, fun questions. Uh, I guess. <laughs> cool. Anyway, I see that there are no more questions, um, and therefore we would like to end here. And thank you very much, Suliana, for your time and this fantastic talk. It's great to catch up and see the work getting published at really good, good places. Um, Thanks a congratulations lot. Congratulations and yeah, all the best. We'll catch up later then. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye.